upon the tweet about this event, you can use the hashtag tech social change, tech social change as you um um in case you want to like you want to tweet about this event, but well, it's really great once again to have us here. So I'm just going to go ahead um with introducing some of our um at the chair of the panel in particular, we will in turn introduce other guests today. But um Today, so the chair for the for this event, as I as we all know, is um, Professor Alcinda Onwana. She is a professor of anthropology and international development, and she's currently the in, the interregional advisor on social development policy at the United Nations in New York. Uh, also, she's a visiting professor at the, at the London School of Economics, and we're so delighted to have um, Professor here with us today. And just to mention that. Um, the, the viewpoints of professor in this event are not uh, representative or not uh, reflective of opinions of the United Nations. So just to mention that, but well, it's we are really delighted to have professor here with us to chair this event as well as other guests. So um, just before I pass it on to our should, um, I just want to ask confirm from Anna if we are cool with the live stream and we we can proceed. All good. Okay, awesome. All right. So professor Alcinda. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all the presents. Thank you for joining us for this uh, special event. And I would like to thank uh, Bolu also for inviting me to chair uh, this uh, important discussion. And as Bolu mentioned, I'm currently working for the United Nations, but I'm also an academic. And I'm participating in this event in my own capacity as an academic and not representing the views of the United Nations. Um, this discussion is an important discussion because it fo focuses on technologies in contemporary social movement dynamics in Africa. Uh, although we have uh, most of the speakers speaking about situations in Nigeria, the idea is that we have an open discussion also about experiences in other uh, parts of the continent. And for today, we have been able to assemble a, a fantastic group of speakers that we thank them uh, for accepting to join us uh, today. Um, our first speaker is going to be Samson Itodo. Samson is the executive director of Yaga Africa, and uh, he's also the convener of not too young to run. Samson is um, a community organizer and uh, a development practitioner, and he has over a decade of experience in constitution building, governance reform, electoral governance, civic engagement, and political organizer. He is a member of the Board of Advisors of IDEA which is an international organization that supports and promotes democracy around the world, but he's also the founding member of the African Movement for Democracy, AMD, which is a network of activists and young leaders who are dedicated to deepening democracy in our continent. Uh, Samson is currently pursuing a master's in public policy at the University of Oxford, and he has been exploring the impact of social movements in refining public policy in, in Africa. So Samson, it is a pleasure to have you with us and I'll give you the floor. If you could talk to us for about seven minutes about the key issues you have prepared for us today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Professor Alcinda and Alcinda, and it's good to to see you um, in, well, not in person, but to see you online and followed your work um, around youth, um, youth revolt and, and youth um, involvement in, 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 in pol political and social change in, in Africa. Let me, let me also thank um, Bolu and the team at LSE for inviting me to, to share and also learn um, and it's, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to, to be here this afternoon um, to share um, the, some, some thoughts. Well, 
Mulu has asked me to talk about, you know, um, technology and, and, and social movements and how social movements are leveraging technology to advance their, their cause. Over the last couple of months, or perhaps years, we've seen how social organizing or community organizing have been transformed um, through the use of, of technology and, and, and social media across Africa and across the world. We've seen tools, um, tech tools being used first to create awareness around social issues. Um, and this is what we call the, the, the decentralization of political education. So um, usually political education and social mobilization or social education has been limited you know, either to formal education institutions or traditional institutions and also our religious institutions. But what we've seen is an explosion um, of um, you know, different platforms that are you know, educating the public and particularly young people around, you know, around their history, around the struggle for change, and also pathways for pushing for democratic reform. So I'd say that one of the things that technology has done for, for social movements and how social movements have leveraged technology is to expand the frontiers of political mobilization or, pol or political education. So that's, that's quite unique. The, the second strand, which is a new trend, not necessarily new, but I would say is the role that technology is playing in providing evidence um, that social movements and civil society organizations use to advance causes. Um, if we look at the NSAS protests, and I know we'll talk about that um, today, we talk, talk about the, the Lagos or the Lekki massacre. The only body of evidence that we have um, today, it's, it's the, either the videos that were, um, that, that were put on social media or the tweets um, or Instagram posts or Facebook posts. Now, these platforms, you know, have been used to provide evidence to establish claims or to counter, you know, negative um, narratives around some of the issues that social movements um, um, push or, or drive. And, and so it's quite unique and we're seeing this um, because across Africa over the last decade, we've also seen reforms um, within um, the judicial um, system of different countries around um, the admissibility of, of electronic evidence or videos or tweets and whether they are admissible in courts. We've seen how countries have also responded by reviewing their, their, their jurisprudence or legal system to respond to this rapidly evolving and changing environment. And so this aspect around gathering you know, evidence, um, it's something that um, social movements have, have done, just leveraging on, on, on technology. One very, um, perhaps also very unique um, um, way that um, social movements are leveraging technology is through funding change um, and funding activism. Um, and this was, was strongly, strongly visible, um, you know, in the NSAS protest where FEMCO um, leveraged um, te technology, leveraged social media to mobilize or crowdfund um, resources. And they raised over $200,000 um, um, to support this, this movement the the answers movements how these monies were distributed in such a transparent manner also goes to show that these platforms really have potential you know to support movements um even in times where international organizations or traditional donors um weren't readily available um you know to support this struggle um this organization you know, leverage social media, leverage technology um, to, to, to mobilize resources. And so that's, 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 that's a lesson from, from the NSAS protest. It also happened in Namibia as well last year um, when 25 protesters were arrested, you know, and, and detained. And then the young people and the millennials and Gen Zs in those countries, you know, use these technology, um, technological platforms to mobilize resources. The fourth and perhaps the last is about solidarity and how these tools, how social media 
has been a galvanizing um, force for, for international solidarity or local solidarity. How, it, but for social media, um, the NSAS protest and the kind of solidarity that it generated uh, wouldn't have been possible. We saw protests in, in the US and Europe, in Asia, in different parts of the world. Same also applies to Free Senegal, which just happened a few, few, few months ago, where you also had Free Senegal um, protests across the world. So in, in terms of how and the advantages that this, you know, these tools um, um, tend to portend for social movements, I, I've just highlighted sort of what I call four domains. But I cannot conclude but, you know, by highlighting the role that the state has also played. And the state, rather than embrace these tools, as, as a platform for, um, for citizens' engagement and democratic accountability, the state has responded with force. In 2020, um, about 25 or 29 countries shut down the internet. 12 of those countries are in, are in Africa, 10 in Sub-Saharan Africa, and two um, in, in, in North Africa. Ethiopia alone, you know, shut down, you know, the internet about four times, um, um, last year, Kenya. It happened in Nigeria as well. And we can't have this conversation, you know, without really condemning the response by the Nigerian government um, to banning um, Twitter. And today we've got to keep it on. And what you are seeing is the state is just responding by shutting down these platforms because they want to escape accountability. And social media, um, social movements have a fundamental role to keep pushing the envelope and the frontiers for public engagement and ensure that this struggle for a better, a just society that delivers what you call the dividends or the promise of, of democracy um, is, is, we attain that, that, that sort of society. And, and, and this, for me, provides a huge, huge opportunity. Chair, let me stop. I hope I've exhausted. I didn't go beyond my seven minutes, but... Um, over to Thank you. you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for this presentation. In fact, you have touched on uh, upon four critical areas in which uh, um, social movements are leveraging on, uh, on technology. First, this expansion of the frontiers of political education and mobilization, the evidence that comes with showing videos and what's really happening on the ground that cannot be dismissed as just uh, uh, nothing is happening, but also this idea of funding and mobilizing funding beyond donors by tapping into other networks, grassroots networks, and also this internationalization of, uh, of the youth struggles of the social movements beyond borders through, the, the, through technology. Thank you very much. This was very illuminating. So I will now uh, present you our second speaker, which is Oluwasenu Oswobi. And she is the executive director of Stand to End Rape Initiative. Uh, she's a gender equality advocate and sexual and gender-based violence prevention and response expert. And she has several years of experience of work in this area. Her work has been so relevant that she has been recognized uh, for what she does, not just in Nigeria, but internationally. For example, in 2020, she was awarded the Global Citizen Prize for Nigeria's Hero. And she was also recognized by the United Nations as a young leader for, for the Sustainable Development Goals, but she was also recognized by the Commonwealth as a Commonwealth Young Person for the year of 2019. Olua Seyun, she uh, uh, has dedicated her work uh, to teaching consent education, to providing capacity building and support on sexual violence prevention but also on interventions. She has worked with governmental organizations and also advocacy groups to help pass on gender-centered laws in Nigeria, such as the Violence Against Persons uh, Prohibition Bill, uh, the Gender and Equality Opportunity or Equal Opportunities Bill, as well as the Sexual Harassment in Tertiary Institution Prohibition Bill. 
So thank you for being here. And it's a pleasure to have you. And we look forward to your presentation. Like Samson, you also have seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, and thank you to the LSE team for having me here. It's great to, to be here. Um, Samson already laid the foundation for technology and social movements. So I would just you know, add a few things. Just for context, activity, activism takes different you know, forms and shapes. For some activists, participation means you know, communicating in chat rooms on electric bulletin boards. While for others, it means online support coupled with you know, real world interaction aka protests, matches, sit out, all of those things. But in general, technology is a tool for socially conscious individuals to mobilize more protesters or more people to sign a petition. And this can then translate to offline movements and engagements. In Nigeria, which is where I work, since 2014, Twitter has grown into one of the largest social media platforms um, that has undeniably influenced social movements um, in Nigeria. So I'll just give you a bit of things that, you know, technology has helped to advance um, for me as, as an individual or as, as a gender equality advocate. So um, we use technology to raise awareness on rape, to mobilize, you know, young people on different issues. So you can, you know, look back from um, hashtag stand to end rape to hashtag by Nigeria to hashtag say I name Nigeria market march and the recent Twitter ban. Um, technology is really shaping how young people are mobilizing and fighting you know, social injustices, and this is translating to offline efforts. Just like Samson rightly mentioned, it also shrinks the world. In my opinion, it's easier for you to you know, reach out to your friend in the US to mobilize funds or um, to come together to raise awareness than to you know, be in a community and reach somebody in Tokoto, which is the, the north, northern part of Nigeria. Um, it also helps to sustain advocacy and protests and also galvanize um, global support. Bimba Cargos is a very clear example of, of um, this kind of advocacy. I think one thing that has been critical for me in my journey of advocacy is how technology can help us to, you know, um, foster cross-cutting advocacy um, between, you know, different generations, Gen Zs and millennials, as well as across um, African countries or even global, um, the global space in general. For instance, in October 2014, um, young people organized um, over social media against their then president, the, the president of Burkina Faso, who plans to change the constitution to run for another two terms to extend his tenure. We could see young people really using that platform to, to you know, um, alter that from happening. And we got so many people from Africa who lent their voice or voices rather to that conversation. Um, social media is also used to demand accountability. Um, young people in Senegal, for instance, leveraged this to draw attention to their country's high unemployment, which then translated to protests on, um, offline. And that really um, galvanized the population to vote out their president and their then president, um, President Wade, in the 2012 election. So, what am I saying in essence? Social media can be used for either online activism or to translate to offline activism. But for the future, we must take you know, note of the following. Protests will not last forever. So while young people in recent years have become you know, the most politically engaged on the continent, their involvement has primarily, primarily been around you know, protests and activism rather than voting. It is gonna be sustainability for social movements. Um, we also need to look at matching our um, advocacy with concrete actions in terms of you know, voting out corrupt leaders, educating people in the communities on how to vote right or you know, how to recall representatives or basically just consistently engaging leaders through town halls, open letters um, or any other platform that, that is available. Um, but we just need to ensure that there is a balance between the you know, protests and then follow up actions. Um, we also need to take note of you know, bridging the divide. And this is something I, I learned recently. Um, one of the key protests that, that happened in Nigeria in 2020 sort of got young people on, online to you know, mobil mobilize and galvanize action, but also it limited the engagement of those in the grassroots. We forgot to include labor unions, you know, um, um, you know, smaller groups in the communities are already organized. Um, 
And I think that's one key issue we need to we need to look at. We need to explore collaborations and um, um, you know engagement with these grassroots people. So we're not really creating a divide, rather than you know um, building like a cohesive um, um, voice or engagement. Also, the demands of you know uh, movement, whether online or offline, should not just be directed solely at the pinnacle of power. And what I mean by this is it's important that we are also engaging at the local government level, the civil service level, the private sector. All of these sectors also contribute to the issues that we're actively fighting against. And sometimes we direct our activism or um, social movements online or offline to the wrong um, people. Then finally, I think considering the demands of social movements um, through technology, it's important that we expand to accommodate broader issues of governance and accountability. So issues of police brutality, sexual violence, um, you know, subsidy in fuel, all of those conversations leads to like a broader issue of governance and accountability. And we need to, you know, decentralize focus um, that really captures the reality of Nigeria in terms of local levels and helping to create change at community levels, at you know state levels, and at national levels. And to, to wrap up, I'd say that um, technology really helps to advance social movements and sustain them because we've seen um, things like Sex for Grades lead to a documentary which has now led to a policy in the House of um, the National Assembly. So it can really bring about policy change and we just need to be specific on how we're using technology and social movements to, to drive change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olua Serun. It was a very interesting presentation and I think you expanded from where we started with Simon by bringing up issues about you know, voting and going beyond the protest and looking at expanding the, the, the bridging the divide and expanding those who are associated uh, uh, in those, those movements, not just people who are in context that they can have easy access, but also people in the grassroots and reaching out to local level communities. But also that the struggle doesn't have to be a struggle just with the top layer of politics. Politics happens at different layers. How do we reach local governance and communities and involve all of that? So very interesting indeed. And uh, let's move on to our third speaker. Uh, Dele Farotimi, it is a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks, you, thanks for accepting to be here. And uh, Dele is a lawyer and political activist. He is the founder of the Dele Farotimi and, and Co., which is a, a legal firm uh, that he established in 2002. And uh, he's also a member of the Citizens Rally Against Oppression and he was the president of the student union at Lagos State University in the 90s, 94, 95. Uh, Delhi has remained in active legal practice for many, many years until he retired a few years ago. Uh, he's a political commentator and the author of the book, Do Not Die in Their War. Uh, a treatise uh, on Nigeria's contemporary political trajectories. And so Dele, thank you. And we look forward to hearing your presentation. Good evening, Prof. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Bolu, thank you very much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, my respect and regards to both Samson and Oluwashion. It's been a pleasure sharing the platform with you. Um, when you ask a 53-year-old man to come and speak on the subject of technologies and contemporary dynamics and pro contemporary protest dynamics in Africa, lessons for the future of collective action, what you're doing in essence is that you are asking a fish to teach the birds how to fly. I'm an old man. I can barely negotiate my way around the internet. 
But I have learned something from this generation, my children's generation, my younger cousins, and it is the fact that the world has become a global village. It has shrunk. It's shrunken now. So because of that, technology has become a very important part of what needs to be done in Africa, particularly in Nigeria. The two previous speakers have spoken at great length in relation to the application in the hands of that generation that is very conversant with the use of technology. So let me speak from the perspective of a Luddite. A Luddite being somebody, of course, who is not particularly comfortable with the use of technology. Having said that, I have quickly understood the immense opportunity that information technology offers to those who might seek to change the status quo, not only in Nigeria, as I have said before, but in Africa itself. What social media has done, all this new technology, what it's done is that it has democratized the information space. Once upon a time, it used to be that to get information, you were either completely dependent on government censored TV stations or the NTA itself. But as Samson rightly pointed out in his presentation, we've had the opportunity of resting back on the evidence produced by the several mobile phones that were on the crime scene, particularly on the 20th of October. What that has proven is that even when governments might elect to lie about the crimes they have committed, the availability of social media makes it almost impossible for them to hide. As somebody said in response to the Floyd Patterson killing, Floyd, the Floyd killing in Minnesota, said, is it that more black people are being killed? No but more black people are carrying phones that have videos so they could record. So what you're seeing is that increasingly, even though African states would like to pretend that they are democracies, the democratization of the media space has made it impossible for them to continue to hide their crimes. Now, how does this dovetail with the world having become a global village? And this is where I think it is important. And this is where I think this generation needs to properly define the cause and the nature of their struggle. The West particularly have several double standards by which they engage Africa. They have words that mean one thing in their society and they tolerate it when it means completely different things in our own society. The NSAS thing shows very clearly, the protest shows very clearly that when you internationalize the argument, it becomes difficult for the foreign governments and our own governments to justify the actions that would not be tolerated or permitted in more civilized environment. But if we do not couch our struggles in the right language, we will continue to make the error, if any might have been said to have been made in relation to the NSAS protest. And this is where I draw the lessons. It was Sheung that pointed, Ulua Sheung pointed out something. She pointed out the fact that there was a schism that developed. Those who were protesting and those who were left out of the protest and not carried along. This gulf arose because we did not do the proper mobilization. We did not educate the people. The organizer did not understand why the roads were being blocked. The market woman could not understand. The artisans who lived from day to day, they were not keyed into the struggle because we did not carry the struggle from online. Online not necessarily being on Twitter, social media, but from the elitist point of its ignition, it was not taken down to the grassroots. We need to begin to use all these media as a way to educate our people so that the next time, if we are calling them out, 
there is a clear connection between the reason they've been asked to come and what they are asked to do. So social media is good on its own, but social media without the proper understanding by those employing it and its use to ensure that the proper tissues are connected for those who need to effect the change. We will just be shouting in silos. And that's my own view on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for being brief, but so direct on these issues, and also bringing the view of a generation that is not so versed into these issues, which I think I am struggling between those two generations. <laughs> But you know, very important point, this thing about connecting with, with the grassroots and the fact that social media in itself, it's not a panacea for all ills. And also we have to be cognizant and something that comes up from your um, uh, uh, remarks uh, that I could extrapolate is this idea that social media can also be, good, be, be used to create obstacles to the struggles, to social change by being mobilized by forces that are against that struggle. So while activists can use it in one way, you know, other groups can also use it for disinformation, for passing on uh, uh, messages that will uh, endanger uh, people's well-being, uh, etc. But um, without, uh, I think we have about 25 minutes. I think uh, rather than asking questions directly myself to the panel, I will open up to the, the audience and see if they have um, questions and we will take it from there. Uh, I'm ready to take questions from the audience. Bolu, what is the best way? People will raise their hands. Uh, is there yes, a... I think what we announced earlier is you can drop your questions in the chat and then we'll um, you know, read them out to the guests or whoever in particular you want to address the question. But we've got a question first in the chat from Seth Kamen. Kam 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 okay. um, yeah, he's an incoming LSE student from the United States, but, um, but currently but based in Ghana. So um, I, I, think, I think the question here is addressed to Olua Seon. You, and he acknowledged the fact that you've made a key, question, a key point that um, he has called, okay, let me just read as, as, as he has typed it. Yeah, please. You, you, make, you make a key point that I've consistently noticed and grown frustrated by um, that, that many or most of these movements tend to be almost apolitical or anti-political and tend to be almost too focused on single issues that fizzle out as soon as the issues fade from public consciousness. So, um, okay. Okay, now I think that was actually a comment from him. So the question now to um, Dele is, I guess this is a question for, okay. Um, okay, I would like to ask what your perceptions are on the limited level of grassroots political organizing. Um, I wouldn't even limit this to Africa regarding issues, regarding issues faced by youth and most importantly, the issues of reaching rural and or undeserved populations. So I don't know if you've got a question. What is the question for? Yeah, for, for you, for you actually. Oh, what was the question, please? Yeah, what, what, your, what are your perceptions on the limited level of grassroots political organizing? The limited, no. yeah. You see, there is, um, there is one unfortunate error that has permeated the Nigerian progressive movement. And it is one that assumes that you could revolt on a people's behalf. So instead of going to the people to explain the issues to them, we have tended to speak over their heads and then in a paternalistic manner, presume to know what is best for the persons on whose behalf we presume to revolt. But I have, from my university days, been of the opinion that you could not revolt on anybody's behalf. The Nigerian people themselves, or any people for that matter, have to be connected with the struggle for their liberation before they might ever survive oppression. So 
I believe there is a huge disconnect that any conscious Nigerian of the progressive bent would have to find a way to breach. I seek to do that by using social media, for instance. I give lectures on social media. I know that I'm not talking to the man in the grassroots, but I can reach the man who can reach the man in the grassroots. And then I also try as much as possible to, I try to be as ubiquitous as possible, get in their face, explain the issues. My belief is that when the people understand the issue, you are doing grassroots mobilization to an extent. I can't speak to the barbers, but somebody was telling me today about the conversation she picked up when she went to the barber's shop to have her own haircut. The barber was repeating conversations that he had listened to where I was making some argument. I never got the opportunity to speak to that barber, but he heard me because he's got a phone, he's on YouTube, he's somewhere. He picked it up somewhere. If we understand clearly that we still have a lot of job to do before we might be able to change the trajectories of Nigeria, if we understand that just because the persons in Lagos understands the issue, you can't presume that the man in Kanu understands it. You can't presume that the man in Kankara understands it. But the same issues that affect me in Lagos is affecting the man in Kankara. So we have to find a way, yes, to bridge that huge gulf between what Sheung, Olua Sheung rightly explained as the offline and the online part of this argument. Yes, we can start the argument online, raise the issues online, raise the consciousness of the people online, but until the man on the street, or in law, we call it the Clapham omnibus test, the common man, the market woman, the person in the lag bus, until they understand what the issues are, we rail in vain. We are just speaking Dogon Trenchy until those people get it. If they don't get it, we waste our times. Yeah. So I agree, we need to do a lot of grassroots mobilization and we have to find ever more dynamic ways to do it. Thank you, Dwele. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very interesting point. My, I would raise a question for um, both Olua um, Sheun and uh, Samson following this conversation, trying to deepen this conversation a little bit more, which is the fact that, you know, online uh, and uh, because our topic is tech, the, the how to leverage technologies, but, you know, there are different types of technologies. For example, if we look at the situation in our continent today, cell phones, are quite widespread. And there's some people that use uh, WhatsApp in a much more, uh, uh, it's much more widely uh, um, uh, 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 accessible or WhatsApp or SMS, et cetera, for people who don't have computers and also certain cell phones now that take Facebook, et cetera. And so how to leverage technologies that help advance amongst young people who are savvy in, uh, in the digital world, but also others who are a little bit more remote to that, but they are entering that through their cell phones, et cetera. Because uh, you, you, you mentioned Twitter, but what is the use of WhatsApp, for example, in, in Nigeria for these kinds of mobilizations? And also, Samson, uh, 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 in terms of, uh, of um, expanding those networks, how do you see the linkages between the savvy online use of these networks and, uh, um, and the fight against the interference of counter messages that might come within those, those networks? Okay. Um, yeah, that's okay. Thank you so much, um, Professor. That, that's an interesting question. And just for context to mention that um, the protest that happened in 2020 was targeted as, at a very specific demographic, which is young people. So it may be difficult for a, a market woman to understand it. But if you break it down in a way that helps her humanize the issue, like your son, 
could be, you know, um, profiled and killed, molested, harassed, whatever it is, it becomes easier for her to understand. So I think that was like one of the points I was trying to to make but in terms of the role of other platforms like whatsapp and facebook if you know if you understand the nigerian um, space properly whatsapp is actually one of the biggest problems that i have in terms of you know misinformation and miscommunication that's one channel that is used to spread false narratives um, at, across board political social economic whatever issue it is that's that's one platform and what young people um, are continually doing or continuously doing um, is creating messages specific to older people who use WhatsApp, right? And even young, younger people who use WhatsApp. And it will interest you to know that majority of young people are actually on Facebook. Um, and sometimes we, we tend to forget that Facebook exists, you know, because of the, maybe the algorithm. I really don't know what the problem is. But there's something about Twitter that makes it easier to converse, to mobilize, you know, than it is for other platforms. But I think it's critical that we find ways to work with all the different platforms, especially for older people. Because one thing I noticed is when older people are interested in an issue, it's easier for us to get their support. Um, but when we don't actively involve them in those issues, they, they tend to ignore. Nonetheless, um, I, I didn't want to talk about NSAS at all in my conversation, but I think it's important to note that even with the information that we put out on WhatsApp, some people still did not believe the stories that um, um, young people were killed um, at Lekki or that we were really fighting you know, police brutality. Some assumed we were trying to um, cause like an opera in the country and, and disrupt you know, the flow of, of the country, which is not true. So you can actually engage people using these different platforms, but it's it's not like a definite, um, uh, it's not definite that you would get them to support you. Um, but again, just to wrap up, we just have to find ways to synergize across these different groups and use targeted messaging that this, you know, consumers um, ordinarily like to see or like to hear, yeah. Thanks. Well, thanks, um, Prof, for that question. So social movements help solve the collective action problem in society. And so if we ask the question, whose responsibility is it you know, to promote this political education and consciousness that, that uh, people need, I would say we can't abdicate that responsibility to social movements alone, as much as they exist to solve the collective action problem. And I think that in Africa, we've got, because pre-independence, you know, uh, pre-colonialism, we had African societies that had their own form of governance, although it may be hegemonic and oligarchic in its own respect, but there were structures, you know, that existed before, you know, this colonial, um, this imperialist invaded Africa. And how do we ensure that our traditional institutions, uh, you know, play the, the role that they serve as custodians of our tradition and our culture or our religious institutions or community-based organizations are involved in this sort of political education? And I think that the state has a role to play and that is, you know, integrating things like history, um, things like civics in our, in our curriculum but when we talk about education, it isn't just formal education. We also have informal education. And what sort of platforms can we use to raise that political consciousness in, 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 on the part of people? So things like uh, national days, um, things like um, um, museums and sites. Um, these are all tools that can be used you know, to raise the consciousness of our people because social movements to be honest, they don't really have that. They may have the capacity, but it's going to be a combination of several factors that would lay, raise you know, that consciousness in society. And I ask, are we ever going to get to a point where everybody is educated enough to exercise agency over you know, their, their, their future? Well, we've got to be practical and, and real about that. But you asked about the linkages. 
uh, if you look at the epistemology, epistemology of, this, of these tools and how they've evolved, you can see that there's some level of integration and convergence amongst different tools. And the use of algorithms has really facilitated this. And social movements can, can use this. But you know, we underestimate those who are in the grassroots because I think that the, the, there needs to be proper segmentation of those who are in the grassroots. Um, we think that they don't use WhatsApp. A lot of them use these tools. Um, and I dare say that in some cases, you find that those in the grassroots are even more politically aware, more conscious than those who are in the urban, um, the urban center. So it's not cast in stone that those in the grassroots are not, are not aware of um, some, of this, um, some of these issues. But I, but I think that we can do more. But can we counter you know, the, the, the state and, and its machine of propaganda and, and fake news and disinformation? If you look across Africa, parliaments are, are passing legislations to shrink the civic space um, and then and limit the use of social media. And uh, why is that the case? As we talk about social media and organizing, we need to situate this within you know, the outrage and the fact that citizens um, across the world are, are scrutinizing democracy. Because democracy, either as a way of government or as, as a way of limitation of power, is not delivering to the people. So there's a crisis, there's a fundamental crisis of leadership that we are grappling with on the continent. And what social movements try to do is to use these tools as a means to an end and not necessarily um, the end, uh, educating citizens and building the power that citizens need to get the change um, that they want. But the state is pushing back and so, You've got, you see today across Africa and perhaps even across the world, you have propaganda machines and disinformation warehouses. What is sad is that young people are the tools that are used by politicians. You know, they get, they provide them cell phones. All you need is a cell phone and data. And they are warehoused in, a, in, in buildings where they churn out, you know, fake news and inf disinformation just to neutralize the impact that social movements have. And I'm sure those who were part of the answers can attest to the fact that there was a huge propaganda disinformation machine by the Nigerian state to neutralize and dilute the effect of the messages that um, th those who were the promoters of the movement were, were using. And uh, uh, what was even sad was that even the promoters at some point couldn't couldn't determine which information was fake and which was real. And at some point, they used you know, materials and content that were fake. And that sort of delegitimized some aspects of the struggle. But what stood out was the resilience. And that is why social movements moving forward need to build shock absorbers because the state is not going to fold its hands and watch you alter the balance of power. They want to keep themselves in power. So as we build power with citizens, we must have shock absorbers. But what is critical is that trust, trust is the lubricant that helps the social movements engine, you know, continue to produce the results that, that, that it requires. And that trust is that connecting tissue. And as we, if we're using these tools, we must keep that at the back of our mind. How do we build trust? Um, and how do we ensure that we consolidate on the gains that we made? But like Dele said, and I completely agree, let's not make the mistake to think that we will continually speak for people. Um, it's time to make the people actually speak for themselves. Thank you, thank you. I have a follow-up question, but first I wanna see if there is anyone in the audience that has a question. I don't see anything else in the chat. Yeah, Prof, I was just also going to pose a question if okay. I can very, very quickly. Okay, thank you, Professor. So um, maybe Mr. Daly can answer this and any other member on the panel. Um, you know, drawing from the fact that, yeah, you are elderly and um, um, you must have had some couple of experience 
<laughs> Sorry, you're muted. We didn't get that. So um, you uh, on you must have had a couple of experience in Nigeria proud to the this the proud to this period when digital the digital revolution hit the continent or the world in particular. So um, the question for me is in an environment devoid of technology, in an environment where perhaps you know technology vanishes or there's there are no technologies to leverage just like we have currently in Nigeria, for instance, in, an, in such environment, how do we sustain or maintain that consciousness or how can um, social movements or young people actually maintain their consciousness and really mobilize themselves? So in a, yeah, in, in an environment where there are, no, there are no technologies actually. Well, thank you for calling me an old man. You see, before I, before I shaved my locks, I didn't realize that I had as much gray hairs on my head as Prof has on her own hair. But after I shaved my lock and it started growing, the secret came out. I found that I have quite a lot of gray hairs tucked beneath all the dreadlocks that once decorated my head. But yes, it is for me a generational shift. I am coming from a tradition where when we protested in my youth, it was with tires being burnt on the streets. And then you could see the smoke and that was sufficient to let everybody know that, oh, the students were protesting down the road. But in this age and time, a lot more is achievable because as I have said before, the world has shrunken. It's become just one teeny weeny bit. And what we do in Lagos, is seen instantaneously in Rwanda. It is seen in New York. It is seen everywhere around the world. So unlike before when it was easy for governments to hide what they were doing, it is no longer easy. However, assuming that all this technology disappears and we were to find ourselves back in the 90s when we had to wait by our TV set for 5 p.m. and the government news channel will come on, and spew all the lies. Even if we went back into those days, what I believe is that is a double-edged sword. Right now, social media serves the unfortunate duty sometimes of distracting. So the youth are not as engaged in the process of governance as they could be, because already the system already works to disconnect them from the process. So when they are now left with so many content, so much content, you could be in Nigeria and begin to imagine that you are living in Chicago. If you are fixated on social media and you are forever living on Instagram and what have you. So if you took that away, at least it would then mean that the focus can come back to dealing with our everyday issues. However, I wouldn't want to return to those Ludite days because it then means that our job will be that much more difficult to handle. We, we are blessed to have access to such tremendous te technology and it is up to us to really make the best use that we can of these technologies because it shortens the time and it reduces stress I can, I'm speaking with you. There are some, there are some, there are going to be people several thousands of kilometers away from where I'm sat who can hear me. That wasn't going to happen in the world in which I grew up. And if it was going to happen, it wouldn't be left to the common man on the street to have access to that kind of power. That is why the government is seeking to take it away. It is power. So it wouldn't be nice to go back to that stone age. Yeah. Thank you, Dele. Very important point. Just to conclude, I have one which kind of a, a point to make, and I will make it to Oluwaseun, uh, which is this, this idea that you brought in that I think it's very important, and it touches upon what Dale and also Samson mentioned. The idea of, you know, protests are not protests forever. At some point, you know, how do you link the, the, the mobilization of the demonstration in the street with real engagement in governance and policy development? And what I'm seeing currently with my uh, research is that more and more social movements are getting uh, 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 
stronger connections at community level, at local governance and building from there. So instead of fighting uh, authority from the top, they are kind of mobilizing from the ground up. What is your experience uh, in that area? How do you see the movements and the different networks you've been involved in, uh, with uh, in that regard? Thank you so much for your question. I think one, one key thing is the strategy. You know, who is your target audience? How do you want to reach them? How do you want to build consistent support um, for the work that you do? So I would just make it personal. My work has been around secular and gender-based violence for the past seven years. And I've been a part of different movements, including the Feminist Coalition. And what I have seen across board is, um, what really matters is what platform you want to use to engage. So for instance, if my issue is around sexual harassment in the workplace, I will not necessarily just be fighting government at the national level. I would also be looking at the bodies that regulate, you know, um, so workers generally, um, or that regulate a particular sector. Um, and if it's, you know, looking at issues of female genital mutilation, while I'm fighting government for policies and protesting and doing things like that, I'm also fighting at the local government level Oh, sorry, my video went off. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm also fighting, you know, at the local level, local government level or local level fighting um, the, um, the representative at, at that level or um, the circumcisers. So basically is partitioning who your target audience are, how do you reach them? And how do you want to bring them into your advocacy? Because that's one of the things that I think is very important and helps to build connection and sustainability. It's not just about advocating for or on behalf of, it's also advocating with. So when I do things around women's rights, I find those who are mostly affected by that issue and go to them and sit with them, educate them and hear them as well. And together we can develop strategies on who we, we need to reach. Because sometimes you are at the urban area um, with so much education and access, where you really don't understand the strategy that works at the local level. Um, so I just think what, what really works is when um, movements can really connect with those who are affected by the issue, work with them to develop solutions and then identify key people um, that you want to target. And I think in wrapping up, um, when I thought about the issue of sexual harassment um, in universities, sorry about that. Um, I knew that my target was, you know, universities, the National Assembly, um, and also the NUC, the body that regulates the university, rather than just creating awareness and protesting and doing all of these things, which is great, just to mention, protests and matches are very good tools. But I also thought about collaboration, right? DBC has a big platform, and I'm trying to collaborate with them to create a documentary and then use that documentary to quote and unquote shame the universities to take action on sexual harassment. So I think the underlining factor is your strategy, um, your target audience and um, you know, working with, with the, uh, the beneficiaries basically as stakeholders. Thank you very much. Um... I want to thank uh, all our speakers. It's, uh, it's 12.01, so our time is up. Thank you, Samson, Dele, and Olua Sheun for this uh, fantastic discussion. Thank you to Bolo for bringing us all together and uh, organizing this uh, event. Thanks also to Anna for all the support in the organization and logistics. And finally, thanks to all the participants. Uh, it, is, it is fantastic that you were able to join us. And we hope that you take away uh, a, a lot of food for thought uh, from this conversation. Thank you very much to all and uh, have a nice evening, afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Bye. And